Jason Hensley was born in California and lives in Los Angeles and for many years has been a member of the Christadelphian Church or Ecclesia at Semi Hills. Jason is the principal of a small private school, Heritage College in California, and the professor of religion and Holocaust studies at Gratz Academy. He frequently lectures about the Holocaust as well as the Bible, Christianity, Judaism, and related topics throughout North America. Jason joins Wilderness Conversations to discuss his latest book, which is entitled One Family, Rediscovering Christianity's Relationship with Judaism. And the book summary reads, Christianity and Judaism are two separate religions with two separate approaches to life. Nevertheless, these two religions have often operated in similar spheres, and Christians and Jews have interacted over the centuries. Tragically, and even more in modern times, this interaction often culminated in Christian assaults on Jewish communities and forced conversions to Christianity. But this Christian anti-Judaism did not always exist. Originally, Christianity shared its history with Judaism. The first Christians were all Jews. The first Christians used Jewish scriptures as their sacred text. The first Christians continued to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And over the centuries, Christianity regrettably strayed from its moors and forgot its connection to the Jewish community. This book reconsiders Christianity's Jewish roots, and in so doing it asserts the Christians, despite their doctrinal disagreements with Jews, are to see Jews as part of their own spiritual family. Christianity and Judaism, rather than two religions, are one family. The book's available on Amazon. So Jason, thanks very much for joining Wilderness Conversations, I think for the third time, if my memory serves me correct. Yeah, that's right. Thanks for having me a third time. Um, You've just um, published the book, One Family, Rediscovering Christianity's Relationship with Judaism. And I wasn't sure what to expect, to be be fair, but we'll get into it. Um, And I formulated my own opinions as I was reading through the book, sort of thinking about sort of why you were writing it and, and sort of the style and everything. And then I read the epilogue. And everything fell into place, and it all made it all made sense. Of course, yes. one of the questions I had was why you didn't make the epilogue a prologue, and I wonder whether you you might have had a very deliberate decision for that. That's an interesting question. I, uh, you know, th- this is going to be funny. I I don't actually remember my explicit thought process as far as that goes. I knew I wanted to put in somewhere that the reason that this came out now was because of as a result of october 7th right and and the various things i was seeing in north america but as far as putting it in the front part part of it is uh, you know i'm glad i am glad that it's at the end because i don't want i don't necessarily want people to come to it and say oh well this is just in response to to what happened and sort of discount the biblical foundation of it. Yeah, I I, I sort of thought that might have been the reasoning. Um, yeah. So I hope you don't mind me staying with the epilogue because I just thought oh, that's fine. You know, the first question I would usually ask was why did you write the book, which is exactly what the epilogue's about. Yeah. Um, and you know, we don't have to talk about October Seven too much, but just where the where the material came from, because I think it is um, informative as to the style of book it is as well. Yes. A, a lot of it was brought out by well, I guess I should I should back up. So the book the book was originally a dissertation. That was the intention. It was a, it was a dissertation that uh that my committee didn't like. So I I ended up having to write a different one because they they said it was too broad. Um it's just a, the the Christadelphian style that we have of attempting to talk about the entire Bible at once yes. <laughs> is really not a thing that um, that a lot of scholars like. I still feel like it's very valid, which is why I published the book. Um, and I, I think this is a helpful style because we want to understand the whole Bible. Um, but that's why it, it was sort of like a, it was a dissertation that I just sort of put on hold. And I had been sitting on it, not sure what to do. And then October 7th happened. And I found myself shocked by a lot of the things happening in the U.S. and particularly California, Los Angeles, where I am, there's a very large Jewish population, and it was it was just astonishing. Mm. 
to see to see everything and and to meet with a lot of Jewish people that I know. A lot of the students that I teach at university are Jewish, and I'm heavily involved within the Jewish community, and I I uh, speak at synagogues, and so it just it was fascinating and scary to connect with them and hear what they're going through and mm. just what they're experiencing as a community and, and the anti-Semitism that's showing up. I, uh, I sat next to a, uh, a director of a Jewish federation, which I don't, I don't know if you have those in Australia, but they're yeah. there. You do. Is it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, so I sat next to a director of a Jewish federation and um, it really shocked me because she started talking about the swastikas that had been spray painted on their building and, and all this stuff. And I was like, what? Yeah. Like in, in the U S you know? yeah. yeah. Like, and it, it was just, it was weird, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't like this was the Jewish Federation of Los Angeles, right? This was like a little town kind of thing. So it really, it really struck me. And then there was a protest near one of our ecclesial halls and it didn't have to do with the hall but it just it, it just really struck close to home because of that it was just mm -hmm. a mile or two away and uh at the protest a pro-palestinian protester struck a pro-israeli protester and killed him and I, it was it was like shock waves all throughout the community and jewish people saying like how, how could this have happened like a, a jewish man killed at this and uh, and I ended up, I, I got invited to the vigil um, and I, I went and just experiencing this with the Jewish community. So I just very felt, very much felt like, okay, it's time to get this out. And not, not only for Christadelphians, but also for all the Christian students I have. Like uh -huh. I've, I've been telling people, Hey, check out this book, right? Like you, here's what I've written. You got to look at this. I'm, I'm writing for the times of Israel now. And so I'm trying to, to kind of bring that out too. And connect people to the book there. So I, I really just feel like it's a book for right now. And this all goes back to late last year when you decided to publish. Well, how much worse has it got since then? And in fact, I'm just I got the Australian newspaper open right now. Uh, article today: Police raid Columbia building as protesters dig in. The New York police have climbed through a window at Hamilton Hall in a dramatic scene after pro-Palestinian watchers occupied the building. I mean, they've actually literally taken over the university. I mean, who would have thought? Uh, and th th this isn't; th these are pro-Palestinian -pal um, people supporting Hamas, no less. Yeah, yeah, and they're calling they're calling for killing all the Jews and you know stuff like that. Like it's crazy to hear this. I um, I recently got invited to speak at one of those universities, <laughs> one of the ones that's having all this big stuff. And thankfully, it looks like that was put on hold because they wanted me to talk about Israel, and I was yeah, like, right. oh, I. You know, I don't, I don't know about this, but yeah, it just, it really, it, it's one of those things that you look at this and you think this can't, this can't actually be happening. Like right. this, it, it's pretty, yeah, it just blows your mind. Well, let's go back to the beginning then. It's actually quite a simple argument to follow and it's, I guess it's laid out in the five chapters. Maybe just before we start, just so people kind of know where we start and sort of where we're heading as we sort of quickly do a pricey of the book. Can you just talk us through the five chapters and the argument you make through the book? Yeah. So uh, as far as the chapters go, basically the, the first chapter is really just laying out the, the foundation of what even is Judaism. It's, it's a, a word that we use in English, but it didn't, it didn't really even exist in the first century. So like, so what, what is this when we talk about Judaism? So it's giving giving definitions of that, and then what is anti-Judaism, and how is anti-Judaism different from anti-Semitism? And I, I think that those are really important distinctions, just because we can sometimes be sloppy with it, and when we don't have the right definitions, we can also misunderstand what people are saying. Right? There's been a few people who have just... I, there, was, there was one person who read only the back of the book, and then wrote wrote all this stuff about how I couldn't possibly understand the truth and how would I really know what the gospel is and all this. And I was like, okay, you know, I think it's important. You should probably read the book <laughs> right. and, and understand, you know, here's here's the definitions. This is what I'm talking about. It's the stuff you're worried about is not a thing. <laughs> so so that's what the first chapter is about. And it lays out the methodology of here's how we're going to approach this. Then the second chapter 
works through that methodology. And the idea behind the methodology is what well, we talked about it here on this, on this podcast. Uh, I really laid it out in the book, the Bible in context, mm. but the methodology says, okay, there's three steps. The first is you have to understand the historical context. The second, then the literary context of a passage. And then the third is the biblical context. So the second chapter is the historical context. And so we're looking at, all right, you open up the gospels and all of a sudden there's these people called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Who are they, right? Where did they, where did they come from? They're not anywhere in the old Testament. So, so who are they? What did they stand for? What's the relation that they have with Jesus? And these are all things that I think they're not explained in the new Testament because the people who are reading the new Testament would have known. Right? Yeah. So the, so we kind of have to build up that historical context. Then the third and the fourth chapter walk through the literary context of what was Jesus's relationship to the Judaism of his day and what was the relationship then of his followers, that's the next chapter, to the Judaism of their day. And then finally, the last chapter is, okay, now let's just take this thesis that we have this idea that, that there was actually a connection between the early Christians and the Jews at the time. And let's see if it holds up to the teaching of the Bible as a whole. And that's that's really the final, the final idea. So it, it walks through that historical, literary, biblical, and just says, okay, so when you can see all of this, you can bring it together that, that there's this strong connection between the early Christians and Jews and then, in fact, most of the early Christians saw themselves still as Jews, and so that's something I think that we've we've lost, and we've we even though we disagree with with the Jews, right? Our, our gospel is very different than what they believe, mm. but but there still biblically appears as though there's still supposed to be that affinity, and that's why I I titled it one family. You can have disagreements in families, and that's okay, yeah. but you're still a family. Well, getting back to the ground work, which is the first chapter, you do actually talk a little bit about the Holocaust and some of the drivers behind the Holocaust and the terrible things that happened there. Do you want to just quickly talk about that as, as, a, as a scene setter? Yeah, that's one of the things that really shocked me as, a, as I became a historian, but just this idea that Christianity was often very strongly anti-Jewish and that eventually culminates in a number of Christians being willing to perpetrate the Holocaust. Mm. So I'm not I'm not saying that all Holocaust perpetrators were Christians, but but the population of Germany was like 90% Christian at the time of the Holocaust. So I, I mean what do you do with that? Right? It's mm. one of those things that you you have to acknowledge there was something wrong going on there. So so that's sort of the piece that I look at as far as the Holocaust goes. How how did Christianity go so wrong? It's a religion of Love your neighbor as yourself. And yet here are Christians taking part in killing Jews. And some of them going around and saying, this is what they deserve. This is what should have happened. And why? Why is it like that? And, and you only spent a, a page or two on that just as an introduction. I mean, you, you could have probably gone off into a rabbit hole and talked about Luther and some of the things he wrote and so on, but I guess that's a whole another another world of discussion which which sort of sets that scene as well. Yes, yes. You know, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I, I initially had a first chapter that was all about that, and, and particularly, like, it had, it had half of it was about Luther, as you, as you say. But I ended up taking that out because I felt like it sort of took the book in one direction and then the book went a different way after that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's a helpful it's a helpful thing to talk about here just so that people are are aware of it. But yeah, I I, I ended up taking that part out. Yeah, no, it made sense. And I kind of was thinking the same thing. Well, so the methodology, which is the historical context, you get into um the people that were around in the time of, of Christ and so on. Um, you talk about the difference between Judaism and anti-Semitism or anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. Do you want to just talk about the difference of that because it becomes crucial to the argument? Yeah, I, th I think that this is a really helpful distinction because a lot of people just say anti-Semitism 
without understanding the historical the historical roots there. So anti-Semitism wasn't coined until the late 1800s, and it was coined in reference to German hatred of Jews racially. So what happens is this idea of race develops. It starts 1600s-ish, and it slowly develops, develops, develops until the 1800s, and you get this picture growing within Germany that Jews are a separate race then, and therefore anti-Semitism is coined because it specifically means hatred of Jews as a race. Anti-Judaism is different because it's hatred of Jews as a religion or hatred of Judaism as a religion. And that's really important because that's that's essentially what we're looking at when it comes to Christianity. It's where did this Christian anti-Judaism come from? Essentially, Christianity was initially a Jewish sect. So what what made this division and then what perpetuated it? So that's essentially asking the question of where did anti-Judaism come from? And I guess the implication is that anti-Judaism can lead to anti-Semitism. Yes. Because the way the way you think about the Jews. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So on page um, 13, you mentioned anti-Judaism includes the portrayal of Judaism as being um, eternally rejected by God. The Jews were replaced by the church. Um, there was inherited guilt upon the followers of Judaism because of the killing of Christ and ultimately demonizing those who fo follow Judaism. And that's what we're talking about when you talk about anti-Judaism. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like those four points are, are very specific and they're, they all are connected to things that you can see historically within the church. Chapter two then goes on to the historical context, uh, first century Judaism. Uh, and you've already mentioned that you've talked about some of the, the people that Jesus speak to. And it's interesting that you mentioned at the, when we first started our conversation, how that those that were reading a dissertation thought you were too broad in your, uh, in your comments and, and the way you, you, you presented this. I, I, my thought was how detailed you are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. It's, it's all a matter of perspective, I guess. But I will say, like I've heard, I've never actually studied the Pharisees and Sadducees you know, per se. Um, I've heard a number of talks on them. But I will say, you go into quite a lot of detail, all with um, scriptural backing and a little bit of um, historical backing as well to demonstrate, I think most interestingly, the difference between them. And then what I found really fascinating, how that, that then is borne out in the way Jesus interacts with them. It's not yeah. the same, which I thought was yes. really interesting. Well, so let's talk about that. So um, let's start with, say, the Pharisees. Um, let's describe who the Pharisees were, and then we can particularly focus on the difference between the Pharisees and some of the other sects that Jesus interacted with. Sounds good. So the Pharisees were really the main leaders of the time. So they were kind of like the, the lay leaders. They could be typically from any tribe. They did a lot of studying and whatnot. I, I think people are generally aware of that. But the thing that, that's most interesting to me about the Pharisees is that they really developed out of attempting to figure out the spirit of the law. And that, that just shocked me when I, when I realized that. Because we often say about them, oh, you know, they were legalists and letter of the law. And it is true that that's what it became. But, but the initial intention was to figure out the spirit of it. And what that, what that led to was this development of all these traditions that were supposed to uphold the spirit of the law. That, that was the idea. Now, what I thought was really powerful about this is that in the Gospels, there's a number of links that connect Jesus to the Pharisees. Now, I, I want to be very careful how I say this. I'm not saying that Jesus was a Pharisee, <laughs> so just, just to make that clear. But, but it is really interesting that when people talk to him, they call him rabbi. And that's specifically a term that was used for the Pharisees. So, again, I'm not saying that he was one, but that it, it seems like people often saw him with them and just assumed that he was part of that. And I, I think that that's really important when we're looking at 
just the context of him saying woe to you and you hypocrites and things like that because he's doing it essentially from a, a point of like inside the group uh, and that to me is is a really big difference you know it's like a, a christadelphian coming and saying hey we need to change this about the way we do things this isn't good versus somebody on the outside saying hey you guys are all bad and that it, it makes it it makes it very different and it's significant that Nicodemus came from that group as well, isn't it? You sort of get a bit of an insight there. Yes. But yes. I'm jumping ahead. Um, you, um, you talk about, you, you draw um, quotes from Josephus, who speaks about um, many of the observances were, six, were passed on from fathers and a lot of their, their detail, as you said, spirit of the law, the oral Torah, you call it. Um, yeah. And that was really what they were about. They were about in trying to interpret what God wanted of the people. So a very genuine attempt, or well, yeah. a, a genuine uh, desire, I guess. How well they ended up doing it is another question. Yeah, that's right. And that's, that's why I think Paul says they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Right? It, it, yep. it really was sincere. And I think that also explains, too, why when you see Christ why he's consistently entering into these debates on here's what the law actually meant, right? You heard it said, but I say unto you, and, or, you know, trying to say, here's the real point of the Sabbath, right? Because he's, he's entering into this world where the Pharisees are going back and forth on what does this mean? What's the spirit? And he's telling them, here's the spirit. Here's, here's what it is. And one of the other significant things about, uh, the Pharisees was they actually did believe in a, a resurrection, a, a life after death. So they believed that they were accountable for the way they behaved in that in that sense. Yes, yeah, which is a big contrast to the the Sadducees. Big contrast. Um, well, let's talk about the Sadducees then, who didn't believe in the resurrection, and and probably most people probably have a sense of that because um, that pops up a couple of times in in the way Christ and Paul deals with them. But tell us a little bit about the Sadducees, and particularly in contrast to the Pharisees. So the Sadducees are a really interesting contrast, because unlike the Pharisees, where you could be a Pharisee, no matter what tribe you were from, to be a Sadducee, you typically were a priest. So that's usually how it worked. So that would mean that you were a Levite. And they often, they didn't have this belief in a resurrection. They didn't believe in providence, whereas the, the Pharisees did. So there's sort of this feeling of God gave you the Torah and that's that, you know, and that's, and that's the end. And so this is why you see a lot of uh, Sadducee connections with the Romans. So this was one of the things the Pharisees were frustrated with. They, they tried to separate themselves and that's, that's what their name means, separate ones. And whereas the Sadducees had connections with Pilate, they had connections with, with Herod, this sort of thing to try and, and retain power. Um, Josephus makes an interesting, an interesting parallel. He says that the Sadducees were like the Epicureans and the Pharisees were like the Stoics. So I, I thought that that was a really interesting connection, a really interesting quote, just to see that, that we often think of, well, maybe we don't think of those groups, but <laughs> those, those Greek, those Greek groups are like, the ones who say, go do whatever you want versus stoicism. Yeah. So there was like this parallel in the, in the general community. There was a parallel in the religious community as well. Yeah, that's right. So it's interesting to see that. And, and I think it really underscores that in, in the crucifixion, it's a big deal that Pharisees and Sadducees come together because they really didn't agree on anything. And one of their one of their um, foundations was they believed only what was written in the Torah, and it was sort of like a I'm guessing like a minimalist sort of uh, understanding. They weren't that interested in trying to explore what it might have meant. Just do the bare minimum and and live a practical life, get the yeah. benefit of it. I guess. Yeah, that seems to be the idea. And then there were the priests themselves, um, who were specific Sad Sadducees, like the high priest in particular. Obviously, features in the in the uh, story of Christ as well. That's that's just another piece here. So you have you have these Pharisees, Sadducees, and then the priest group, which kind of overlaps. 
it's it's interesting looking at Josephus because he's he's in a funny position because he grew up a Sadducee, so he was a priest, and then he decides that he doesn't want to be a Sadducee and he becomes a Pharisee. So he's one of the weird exceptions of Pharisees who's also a priest. And you mentioned that the Sadducees were, or well, the priests obviously were really centered around the the temple, and that was sort of a key part of sort of what they were about. The Sadducees were more associated with the priests than the common people, you say, whereas the Pharisees were interested in educating the common people. Yeah, yeah. And that, what's interesting about that to me, as far as history goes, is that's actually what saves the Pharisees. Because when the Romans come in 70 CE, they destroy the temple. So the Sadducees are done, right? They don't have, they don't have anything left because they're the priests they're, and there's nothing to be a priest over. So the Sadducees disappear and the Pharisees continue, and, and that's what becomes rabbinic Judaism. So the, the Judaism we have today is built on the foundation of the Pharisees. And then there's the Sanhedrin. Tell us a little bit about that. The Sanhedrin is interesting, too, because it, it shows up in the Gospels, although depending on what translation you read, you might not notice that it's there. It's sometimes called the Council, but in the Greek, it's it's the Sanhedrin. So this was... This was a, a a council of about 70 elders, so it would include Pharisees and Sadducees, and it had the ability to bring about execution, at least according to the Talmud. And uh, nevertheless, its execution would be stoning. And it appears that there's only certain periods where that kind of thing was actually allowed, which is why they say in the Gospel of John, we don't we don't have the power to put anyone to death. But this, this council, it met in the temple, and it typically determined, here's, here's what the community is going to do and, and in relation to this event that's happening. And there would have been some interesting discussions within the Sanhedrin, given that there's Pharisees and Sadducees there trying to come to some sort of common agreement. Yeah, that's right. And that's, that's why it's interesting in Acts when, when Paul goes in and he says, I'm I'm here over the question of the resurrection of the dead, right? And then the, the thing just erupts. So that was the Sanhedrin. And then there were the elders, which uh, are different again, um, coming again coming out of the Old Testament into the into the New Testament as well. A, another group of people, but potentially, or do you think they're the same as the Sanhedrin? I think there's a lot of overlap. I think that's part yeah. of the the challenge. Um, they they are put out as a different group, like it, when Jesus is arrested, it says it was the Sadducees and the elders. So they seem like they're, there's a different group, but I, it wouldn't surprise me if some of the Pharisees were also elders, but then there were people that were just elders and weren't either of them. So it, it, it's a little bit messy, but there also appears to be some overlap. Well, speaking of overlap, then you've got the scribes. And again, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mentioned quite often in the gospel records. Yes. Yes. So the scribes are the ones who, who wrote the stuff down. So that, that gave them a, a position of authority because of that. And they may, may have been Pharisees as well, potentially? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And they would sit in in the Sanhedrin meetings and they would take notes. So that, that was sort of their position of honor. Um, so in summary, there were two main philosophies, the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees focused... Um, not only just on the, the literal interpretation of the Torah, but they focused on sort of the oral Torah and the spirit of the Torah, whereas the Sadducees were pretty much sort of matter-of-fact people that sort of bare minimum life is to be lived now and enjoyed and then you die. Yeah, yeah. Which, to me, it's a, a, a totally different characterization than what we often give because it feels like... If you look at the two groups, you'd say, oh, well, we know which group's the good guys. It's the Pharisees. <laughs> right. and, and then, you know, you, you see how Christ interacts with them. Clearly, there's major issues going on here. But, but he's working with this group because they're the group that's actually trying to do stuff, right? They're the, they're the group that's sincere and trying to change their lives. Well, that's a good segue into chapter three, which is the literary context. And that's where you get into an enormous amount of detail from the scriptures showing how that Jesus interacted with the two groups differently. So let's have a look at a couple of these examples. Is there a, a good example? Well, it's interesting that 
most of Jesus's interactions are with the Pharisees. So when you take a look at when he's talking to a group of people, it's almost always Pharisees. There's occasional times where it's the Sadducees. You'll, you'll remember the instance where they come with that question about the woman with the seven husbands. So like, so you have that, but, but they usually, the Sadducees usually stay out of it. And most of what's going on with Christ is with the Pharisees. And again, that, that makes sense because the Sadducees largely, they didn't really care about this stuff. And they didn't, they didn't care about dissecting the law and figuring out what is, what does this mean? And uh, I, I think again, it just, it really helps place what Jesus was doing rather than coming as somebody who condemned the Pharisees. I mean, he did, he did condemn them, but it was, it was more like a reformer. And I think that's a, a helpful way to think about it. For a long time, I just thought, oh, those bad Pharisees, you know, like they, they were, they were evil and, and a lot of them were, but Jesus was going in and actually working with this group from a, a position of being with them. And it does seem like a, a, a number of these turned or, or, or were converted after the death and resur resurrection of Christ, yes. Acts 2, etc. And, there, you know, there's obviously a lot of Pharisees and, and uh, priests that were actually converted, which was fantastic. A lot weren't, and, and they caused trouble as well, but they were probably the ones that, that um, once they understood that Christ was Messiah, or well, Jesus was Messiah, yeah. um, they changed their mind like Paul did. Um, so in terms of the, li the literary context then, you make the very, what would seem to, I suppose, Bible students, the fairly obvious point, that Jesus was a Jew. Yeah. But you would never think so, given some of the, the views of Christians, as we discussed. You know what's interesting is I have been really surprised when talking to my university students because the point that Jesus is a Jew sometimes really shocks people. And that it, it's just something that's never really occurred to them. And that's it's the kind of thing where, like, even when you look at pictures, right, you when you look at pictures in books or whatnot of Jesus, or like even in churches, you can see why people get the wrong idea because they look at Jesus and he looks like this, you know, Scandinavian dude or whatever. And, <laughs> and they just, they like, they don't ever, they don't ever think, oh, you know, Jewish <laughs> or something like that. So it, 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 it's just a lot of that, that background that people, people don't often think of. And it's built into the, the gospel record. So we've got, um, his birth and early life. It's all about how he's connected to the history of Israel. Um, his genealogies that are in Matthew and Luke. Matthew spends a lot of time talking about how the, the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled. Uh, Micah's words were fulfilled. Uh, even the reference to Jesus' flight to Egypt, how that was a fulfillment and his life yeah. mirrored the people of Israel. There's a strong connection to the Jewish people in the way Messiah grew. Um, yeah, in, in Israel, I for me this is one of the most exciting parts. Just just because I I knew that it was there, but I didn't know how much it was there, and that's what that's what really surprised me, particularly in Luke. That's what was most intriguing for me because Luke is at pains to say Jesus was circumcised, and he was circumcised on the eighth day, like the law of Moses commanded. And his mother Mary went to the temple to offer an offering, like the law of Moses commanded. Here's the offering she offered, like the law of Moses commanded, right? He just he keeps saying this because he wants to make it very clear that Jesus was born into an observant family. And that's something that I didn't ever think about. Like I knew he was Jewish, but it didn't occur to me that being Jewish would have meant that he followed the law like all, all the time as a, as a little kid. You know that that they would have they would have celebrated the Sabbath every Friday, like that. I know that this sounds funny, but like Jesus, Jesus didn't go to any kind of church on a Sunday, <laughs> like because right. there weren't any, right? Like he he went to a synagogue on the Sabbath, 
And and that's one of those things that when I when I say that to my students, they're like, what? Mm. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it a lot of people just don't think about it. And perhaps even going a step further, the fact that we talk about Jesus lived a sinless life actually incorporates the fact that he kept the law perfectly. Yeah. Uh, if he had disobeyed the law, he wouldn't have been sinless. Yeah, and that's part of Paul's whole point, right? When, when Paul talks about how the law cursed him in Galatians 3, that here's somebody who kept this better than anybody else ever did, and yet the law still cursed him. And then uh, moving on from his birth, even throughout the Gospels during his ministry, we get constant references to the fact that he was a Jew. And you, you, you sort of list some of them. Uh, Matthew 9 is described as having a garment with a fringe, which is a reference back to Numbers 15, where they had the blue fringe around their, uh, their garments. Yeah. He was constantly going to the synagogues, uh, uh, a, uh, a custom that Paul, I think, picked up probably off Christ yeah. in this regard, um, keeping the Passover, etc., and regularly going to the temple. And, and obviously, the temple's a place of prayer for Christ as well. He prayed in other places, no doubt, but he... The temple was an important place in Christ's life. Yeah. Yeah. He seems to really care about the temple. So that's, in fact, there's a, there's a moment in, uh, in Matthew 23 when he, he's cursing the Pharisees, right? He's saying, woe to you because you swear by the gold of the temple. And he, he says, you should swear by the one who is in the temple. And I'm, I, I thought that that was fascinating because the, ar the ark's not there anymore. And yet he's still saying, this is God's house, right? This, this is an important place. I think one of the important subjects also which you address here, you don't go into a lot of detail on it, um, but the fact that Jesus kept the Sabbath. Because I think um, the way the Gospels present, and, and again, maybe we can call it sloppy reading. You mentioned sloppy, uh, I think it was the word sloppy you used uh, earlier on. And I hear people say, oh, Jesus was, you know, ha having a go at their traditions and so on. So he broke the Sabbath. So Jesus went off doing his own thing and because he didn't respect the Sabbath or whatever. I'm not sure people are that direct, but that's kind of the implication. Whereas, yeah. in fact, you argue that Jesus kept the Sabbath perfectly and that he understood what the Sabbath was all about. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what's so powerful, I think, when we look at what Christ does, is that he understands the purpose of the Sabbath and so... He's able to keep it like nobody else can. And so when you read through things like the Sermon on the Mount, when he goes through and he expounds the law, he explains this was the whole point of this law. So here's how you follow it, right? And it's, it's, it's a big thing. So he, he seems to have that, he has that understanding of this is what it really means. So he goes around trying to teach people that. So yeah, I, I, I see him as upholding the Sabbath. And then there was a really interesting section, which I actually really appreciated, uh, and that was, it's entitled Jesus' Biblical Basis, where you go into quite a little bit of detail around how that everything that Jesus said was taken from the Old Testament. And again, it's probably a bit of a personal thing of mine, that um, people sort of read it, and it's like, oh, Jesus is making up these stories. He tells these parables because he, you know, right. saw the, he saw the sower, or, you know, like he, you know, he went to a wedding or something like that, and so he's told the story like it's, just Jesus making stuff up as he goes along. But that's not who Jesus was. Jesus was the Word made flesh. Now, we say that, yeah. but what, what was the Word? Well, the Word was the Torah. It was, it was the Torah and the prophets, right? I mean, so everything he says is rooted in Old Testament. It's, nothing's glib or... Um, yeah. and, I, and I find that really interesting because I do think it has an Im impact on or has an implication in the way we should study the Scriptures and present the scriptures, it's, it's not good enough just to choose some random sort of metaphor and, and sort of make up our own stories. Jesus, I don't think, did that. It seems as though everything he sa said was, was linked back to prof the prophets and the Torah. Yeah. Isn't that so exciting? I, I just, I love that because it, it's what made him absolutely impossible to argue with, right? Because, because he says, you know, this and this. And people want to argue with it, but they can't because they know it's it's straight out of Scripture, which is why he speaks with authority, right? Not like the scribes. His reference to the blessings comes from Psalm 32. You, you go into some detail about that. Um, I thought it was really interesting, the Lord's Prayer and the relationship to the Lord's Prayer uh, and, and the connection to First Chronicles 29. 
Right. Um, and then Psalm 103, how the similarities between the Lord's Prayer and um, Psalm 103. So, so again, Jesus is not just making this stuff up, uh, you know, because he thinks it's a good idea. He's, he's basing it on Scripture. He was the Word made flesh. I just think that's just so powerful. Yeah. He, he, even, even to the point of the structure of the, the order of things that he says, right? Like the Sermon on the Mount, the structure appears to mirror Psalm 15. So I, I just think it's so, it's so neat to see how it's not just quoting verses, but it's like quoting verses and knowing scripture so well that he can give a talk and base his talk on the structure of a Psalm. Amazing. Yeah. Truly amazing. So as having established the Jewishness of Jesus, can I call it that? You don't, not the word yeah. you use there, but that's, that's a sort of the idea, I guess. Um, you then move into further biblical context, and that's, well, what, what then of Jesus' followers, the, the ones that then follow Jesus? What, how Jewish were they? And tell us a little bit about that and, and the argument you're making here. So this was something that it dates back a number of years for me, because I remember doing the daily readings and reading Acts chapter 1, and it said... They went a Sabbath day's journey to the Mount of Olives. And remember, as a young person, it really bothers me. It, it bothered me because I, I read it and I thought, what? Like a Sabbath day's journey? Who cares about the Sabbath? Right? That, was, that was my feeling. Like, no, yeah, nobody so keeps post, awe. post death and resurrection. Yeah, that's right. So I, I was like, why is that even there? You know, I, I, I don't know. So, so I just wrote it down, right? And I started looking for those as time went on. And I started to have a pretty good sized list of places where the apostles were keeping the law, right? Where, where Peter says things like, you know, I, I've never eaten anything unclean, right? In Acts chapter 10. Now that changes, but it hadn't changed until Acts 10, right? So, so there's just, there's a lot of instances of that, that I think we sometimes approach Acts a little anachronistically, like we... We look back and we already know what's going to happen. So we're like, oh, they didn't need the law. But they thought they did. And so they were following it for a long time. And a lot of people appear to keep following it, even once they realize that there's certain things they don't need to do anymore. And that's that's the whole idea behind um, the Jerusalem conference in Acts 15, where James comes up and says, oh, well, refrain from blood, refrain from things strangled and from fornication and, you know, like this kind of stuff. It's like a miniature version of the law that they they put out onto the Gentiles because they and their fathers weren't able to bear the yoke of the law, but they still are struggling with this idea of, well, there's got to be some kind of law. So I saw that as a guidance for the Gentiles. Yeah. You've got a section in here where you talk about Acts 7 quite a bit because... You know, there's, I guess, there's this converse, conversation around Stephen who seems to make the point that you don't need to be in the temple to worship God. Yeah. Just tell us a little bit about why that's important in this context. So I, I think that that's important because what you start to see is that initially the believers did worship in the temple. So you see Peter and John in Acts 3 when they go in by the beautiful gate. So there's, there's that whole thing where they are worshiping in the temple. And then you start to see things begin to change. And that's sort of what, what Acts 7 is. It's like the, the introduction of change where Christians are now starting to say, well, the temple is a good place, but it's not essential. And that's, that's like the beginning of this break from Judaism. Hmm. I'm going to quote um, from your book, page 96, because I think this is a key statement and a key principle. And Paul, you say, makes a crucial statement, and that is that the works of the law do not justify. So justification is through faith. This then is what Paul had torn down. He wasn't specifically re referencing the law, but rather justification by works of law. I think this is a really important distinction because Paul does just refer to the law. 
But we know that the law is wholly just and true. And so we, we kind of have that in one side of our brain. But then on the other side of our brain, we're going, oh, it wasn't necessary. In fact, it got in the way. It caused, you know, it caused death and it was just a failure. And we sort of, we, we, well, we, we may yeah. think like that. And it's a complete yeah. contradiction, obviously. We, how do, so how do, we, how do we reconcile these two? And I think by making the distinction between the law itself and the idea of justification through works of law are two different things. Yes, I, that, that is huge recognizing that because once once you note that distinction as as you said the contradictions go away and everything fits you know it, it used to bother me a lot that in acts 21 paul goes to jerusalem and james says hey uh, there's a lot of people who heard that you don't keep the law and that you're telling people not to keep the law so why don't you just go and do this vow and you know all of that and and paul does it right he he shaves his head and everything and he goes into the temple and i remember thinking like what you know, Paul, this is the Galatians guy. Like Paul, Paul is supposed to be in there saying, no, like I'm not going to follow the law. But, but Paul was like, oh yeah, you know, I, I know the law doesn't justify me, but if people are concerned that I think the law is bad or something, right? And so he says, sure, I'll do that. Mm. And I, I feel like it just makes everything fit. It makes it all make sense. This is the message of the New Testament in relation to the law. The Torah could not bring righteousness. Followers of Jesus were welcome to follow it, and many did, Romans 14 verse 5. Yet they were to follow it with the acknowledgement that it was a vehicle to help them better understand God's principles. It was not followed, assuming that the commands themselves would bring life, and so on. I think that's a point really well made and, and is one of the pivotal points, I think, in which the whole book rests. You then go and talk about the, the Gentiles. So along come the Gentiles which yeah. you've, already mentioned, you've already mentioned the uh, Jerusalem Conference, Acts 15. But there was a context to this. Um, it was always God's intention to bring the Gentiles into his family. Yes, that's right. And I think, I think what's crucial to see that's going on in Acts 15 is that contextual piece, because sometimes we look at that and we say, oh, look, you know, Gentiles were brought in, and that's all that's going on. But the whole question, the whole reason that Acts 15 and the Jerusalem Conference happens is because the Gentiles were joining Judaism. That's, that's what was going on. And typically, when a Gentile joined Judaism, they had to be circumcised. Right? That, that was how you showed that you were Jewish. And so that's why this whole conference is even taking place, because it's in the context of, well, they're now becoming Jews as joining Christianity. So... Do they need to be circumcised, right? We've had in Acts 10, we've just been told you don't need to worry about unclean foods. So is circumcision a thing you need to worry about too? And and the first century ecclesia really has to wrestle through that. But regardless, there's this recognition there that they are becoming part of this family, this community, the family of Abraham. And it's not it's not just like, oh, you know, they're... There's some other thing over there, and so different standards apply to them. But God is saying, well, actually, in this family, circumcision wasn't the point. Well, that's a good segue into chapter 5, which is the final key chapter. The biblical context, separate but united. And so this is around the whole bringing together the, the Gentiles into the Jewish faith, into, into um, a position where, they, where Paul, Paul called his hope the hope of Israel. That's, yeah. that's how he described it. You spend a bit of time on the expression, the kingdom is at hand, repent. Um, this, this sort of key message of, of our Lord as he introduces, well, well, he's introduced that way by the three synoptic gospels as the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel, Mark 1 verse 15. Luke says something similar, um, although Luke says it after Luke chapter 4, which is interesting. And Matthew says the same thing as well when Christ comes out of the wilderness. So tell us a little bit about what the kingdom is and the significance of understanding what the kingdom is that's at hand in the context of what we're speaking about. So That's a big question, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. The, when the Lord Jesus came, he brought this taste of the kingdom. Right? We often say that when you're in the presence of the king, you're in the presence of the kingdom, 
And and that's very much true in the sense that anybody that was around him was essentially experiencing the kingdom. Not not immortality, but if they got sick, he could heal them. If they got hungry, he could give them food, right? It, it was all this, it was this supernatural experience to be with Jesus. And so when he goes around and he says, the kingdom is at hand, that's what he's saying, right? This this time that you've heard about, come here and experience it, get a taste of it. So I think that that's that's an important piece, and that's important because the kingdom had been in existence before that. Right? We we talk about this as Christadelphians that David was king of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. That's what Chronicles tells us. And so what what you see is that when the Lord Jesus comes, He comes to the kingdom of God. Right? He comes to this nation that is the kingdom of God. And yet, people weren't experiencing it, right? It didn't feel any way, anything like the kingdom of God. And so that's that's why he comes and says, look, it's at hand. Let me show you what this actually is, what this is all about. It's very much like Ezekiel 34, where, where God is condemning the crooked shepherds. And he says, you haven't fed the sheep. You haven't done these things. And that's that's what I think the Lord Jesus is, is putting together. And that's why in all of it prophecy why the Lord says that the kingdom is at hand. When really in in that specific section of the Olivet Prophecy, it wasn't it wasn't about the, the literal kingdom coming, but it was in 70 CE, that's when the kingdom of the scribes, the Pharisees, Sadducees, that's when that fell apart, right? And you get a new I, I want to be careful here on how I'm saying this, but you get a new opening of the kingdom for everybody. Now, I'm not saying that the ecclesia is the kingdom. I don't I don't want to try and put that out. I know that's a contradiction to our statement of faith. But what I'm saying is that, that we have this picture of how we are supposed to be an earnest of the kingdom. Right? That's, mm. that's why we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Because we are supposed to be showing... Colossians 1. Colossians 1. This is a picture of the kingdom, right? We, we are to be living that out. And what Jesus is saying to the scribes and the Pharisees is the kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to a people who will bring forth its fruit. Now, I have so often read that as meaning the Jews lose the kingdom and it's given to the Gentiles. But I think in context, he's not talking about Jews and Gentiles. He's specifically talking about the rulers versus the people. And that's that's really what you see going on. That's why he says the kingdom of God uh, has every man pressing into it, right? He's, he's saying, I've brought this earnest of the kingdom. It's open. Everybody's coming in now. Let's, let's get them in. And you guys are losing it. After reading this book, I went and reread Colossians 1 and 2, and I'm not going to get into it now. But with this in mind, Colossians 1 and 2 just makes so much more sense. Because you've got all this um, detail around Paul talking about principalities and powers and being translated into the kingdom. And this is language that is right through Colossians 1 and, 1 and 2. And if you don't really understand this, it, it's a terribly difficult couple of chapters to read because it actually doesn't make sense. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. One of the key texts which you use is the parable of the vineyard, where it was specifically spoken to the, the leaders of the time, and Jesus said that God would come and take away the kingdom from, the, from them. Yeah. And it would be given to a people producing its fruits, Matthew 21, verse 43. So this was the, king, the new kingdom, the, the different kingdom or the kingdom that was going to be revamped and given to the people that were producing fruits, the ones that were following Christ. Yeah, that's right. And that's, it's really, it's this opening up to the everyday people, right? It's not about the leaders anymore. The point being that this is not, well, let's get rid of Israel and let's forget all that stuff and the kingdom of God and all the Old Testament, that's all gone. We're starting again. It's, it's not that at all. It's, it's bringing it back to what the kingdom was always intended to be by God. What Israel was, right? Like that's, is, Israel was the people. That was, that was the whole idea. The importance of AD 70. Mm. AD 70 comes. The Romans come down and take the temple out. Uh, a lot of Jews are 
sent all around the all around the world eventually anyway talk about the significance of the temple being destroyed in this context this this is the moment you know this this is the most significant moment within Judaism and again Christianity at that time was still part of Judaism so this this is like earth shattering the world is gone sort of thing which i think is why you have language in the bible that that describes it as you know an earthquake as the the elements melting with fervent heat things like that so everybody that's connected to Judaism including the christians is left trying to figure out what does this mean and so christianity comes to the conclusion that this is God's declaration that the law is done. And that's, I mean, it's based on Hebrews, right? Where, where it is old and it's, it's waxing old and ready to vanish away, right? Hebrews 8. So, so, and it does, it vanishes away. And so that's, that's where Christianity says, okay, God has just made a revelation that we're done with the law. And so it starts to go in that direction. Chris, uh, Judaism, the Sadducees go away, as I said. The Pharisees are still around. The Essenes, we didn't really talk about them, but they they just get wiped out. So the the Pharisees are the only ones who are left. They they survive by this um, the ingenuity of one of their sages, <laughs> and uh, they they end up restarting. And that's where you get the the Mishnah and then the Talmud, and rabbinic Judaism just sort of develops out of that. And it's still very much this this idea of the oral tradition. So the Mishnah is written in 200 CE, and it is the written down version of the oral Torah. So they're still preserving this, and they finally write it down 130 years after 70 CE. So they're still going in that trajectory. So what 8070 does is it really just solidifies the direction that the two groups were already going. And so they they separate from each other in that sense just because Christianity no longer has a focal point that draws them back to Judaism. So with that said, you ask the question under the heading One Family, if Jesus' followers were to see themselves as Israel, and you've just gone into some detail to talk about Galatians 3 and the relationship between um us, Christ, and the promises to Abraham. So we, we didn't get into that, but that's all there. So if the followers of Jesus were to see themselves as Israel, what relationship would they have with traditional Judaism? Yeah. I, you know, I found myself struggling with that as I was writing the book, just trying to understand what, what does this mean, right? What's, what's the connection for all of us? And ultimately, I, I came to the conclusion that, that really satisfied me, which was that really families don't all agree. And yet there's still a recognition that we're family. We might be estranged family, but, but there's still something there and, and you can't remove it. And I think the followers of Christ, they, they seem to recognize this. And the, the Apostle Paul, you know, in, in Galatians 4, when he talks about the, the two women, Hagar and Sarah, and he describes traditional Judaism as Ishmael and Christianity as Isaac. And I had never thought before that that means that they're siblings. And I, it's not a very flattering picture for traditional Judaism, right? People, you know, you wouldn't really want to say, yeah, I'm Ishmael kind of thing. That's, that's not that exciting. But, but still, it shows there's, there's this connection. And Isaac and Ishmael continued to work together, which, you know, I think is something we don't often think about. But, like, they bury Abraham together as siblings. Mm -hmm. so, so there's this acknowledgement that there's a family bond and that, that doesn't mean that we're best friends or anything like that, but it, it means that there's a connection and we shouldn't forget it. You mentioned in this context the par parable of the prodigal son or the two lost sons. Again, mm -hmm. similar idea if the prodigal son represents those that have come to God, the Christians, if you like. 
and then the the elder son who represents well Judaism and the scribes and Pharisees actually understood from that parable that Jesus was talking about them as as yes. so often they did. Yes. So yeah, I I see that parable as as showing a, a picture again of the the same thing one one family, and that's that's why it's such a big deal when Paul writes about this in Romans that has God cast away His people, right? He's he's writing all of this because he wants people to recognize that God is eventually going to bring together the Jews and the Gentiles as one fully, right? It, it's it's going to be a a complete unity. The family will come back together get together again. Yes. Yeah, the estrangement will be over. Talk to us about the inviolable promise, because this is very relevant for us as Christians today, even. So this, this is so cool, I think. So when you look at the way that covenants were made, what you have going on is you would take an animal, you cut it in half, and then the two parties making the covenant would walk through the animal. And that would symbolize, here's what's going to happen to me if I don't keep the covenant. And so you see that in Jeremiah. Right? God says, you didn't keep your covenant, so this is this is what's going to happen to you. <clears throat> and he talks about the animals and all of this. So what's fascinating is that you can compare the two covenants. In Exodus 24, when the law of Moses is made, you have the sprinkling of the blood on both parties. Right, So both, both have to take part in this. They can't walk through the two animals because the children of Israel are like, over a million people. So instead, Moses sprinkles the blood on, on the altar and on the people. <clears throat> in contrast to the promise with Abraham in Genesis 15, where God forces Abraham to fall into a deep sleep, and instead of Abraham going through the animals, he's sleeping. Instead, God, this smoking furnace, goes through the pieces of the animal, meaning that there's no way that Abraham can mess this up, right? He, ne he doesn't get to walk through the animals. He doesn't get to say, well, this covenant's going to break if I don't hold my part of the bargain. So, so God specifically makes it so that this is going to be an inviolable promise that Moses, or sorry, that Abraham is going to be connected to God, that his descendants are going to be connected to God, and there's no way that that can change. And inviolable means can't be broken. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And then the conclusion? How would you conclude? What's a summary of your findings? So the summary of all this, I think, is that there's a large connection to Judaism and to Jews in the New Testament, in Christianity in general, and yet Christianity has just completely forgotten it, you know, as a whole. Uh, when I when I talk to Christians, I, I just had somebody ask me in my class last week. Um, again, this is a university class. They they said to me, they, they stopped my class. They said, wait a minute. Are you telling me that the Ten Commandments are Jewish? And and I was like, whoa, <laughs> yeah, like. That's that's what I'm saying. And and it's just fascinating to see that so many Christians, if they read the Bible, they only read the New Testament. Very few read the Old. And so I think it's so good that our community spends time reading the entire thing, right? But that's that's really the big thing. I I think all of us still can need to remember that Christianity developed out of Judaism. It was connected to Judaism, and that we still should have a connection with Judaism. Now, I'm, I'm not saying we're supposed to go to synagogue, right? We, we acknowledge that our beliefs are totally different, right? We, we have a whole separate extra section of the Bible compared to them, and, and we believe in Jesus as the Messiah. So I, I don't mean that, but what I mean is that we, we need to recognize that there is a connection with Judaism, and that we're we're part of that family. And so when things happen, like October 7th, we need to be saying, whoa, hey, that was our family, right? Like, that's, that's a big deal. 
you know, and, and mm. we, we shouldn't just say, oh, well, you know, that that's half the world away. Oh, well, that's, that's something we should be praying for, for, um, for Christ to come to save Israel, right? We should be coming, we should be praying for the promises to Abraham to find their fulfillment as soon as they can. And that's, that's why we're told to give God no rest about this kind of stuff. So I, I think this is just, it, for me, it's a reminder that, uh, that there are very tangible ways right now that we can see that God is working. We can see him working with his people and, and that's not just his people, but it's part of our family. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Jason, thanks very much for joining Wilderness Conversations. Mm -hmm.